Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome back to the first episode since Halloween. It has been a crazy busy week, but I hope you guys enjoyed all the cases that we had for you. I've said it once, I'll say it again. Halloween is always the craziest time of the year, but it is such a fun time of the year. And I love the tradition that we have here on Killer Instinct of doing Halloween every year. It's something that's really fun to look forward to. So I hope you guys enjoyed it just as much as I did. Now for today's case, I am so incredibly ready to get this case in front of you today because it is one that I'm actually very surprised hasn't gotten a lot of coverage. And that's for a multitude of reasons. The first one being, it was a fairly recent case. Also the magnitude of the case, how brutal this murder was, along with the fact that this is not not only an unsolved case, but we're dealing with someone who is currently on the run. So this is a jam packed case that I think is so important to talk about. And that is the case of David Carter. Now, if you guys have been on Netflix, you have probably seen Unsolved Mysteries, and that's how I got introduced to this case. They did a whole episode of it on Unsolved Mysteries, and through watching that episode, I started doing my own research and just knew that this was a case that needed as much exposure as possible, and I was able to have the privilege of messaging briefly back and forth with David's sister, Tasia. And through speaking with her, I was able to just get a couple more questions answered to really have the full picture to give to you guys today. So with that all being said, let's jump right on into it. David Carter was born on July 16th, 1979 to his parents, Elton Sr. and Marie Carter. David was the type of person that was extremely goal-oriented. He had big, big dreams for his future, and he was determined on fulfilling every single one of them. One of those dreams, for example, was David had actually founded a clothing brand. This clothing brand is called Lavish Habits Unlimited, which is still up and running today and ran by David's son. You can actually purchase some of their products. They have sweatshirts and sweatpants, t-shirts, hats that you can still buy, and I'll put that link in the description for anyone who wants to check them out. Along with running Lavish Habits Unlimited, David also worked at a manufacturing company. David is also described as a very stand-up guy. He was very responsible, and that responsibility was put to the test when David became a father at a pretty young age. David and his girlfriend at the time, named Samia Connor, had been on and off for about 14 years, and the two of them welcomed a son together in 2002 named David Carter Jr., who also goes by DJ. Now, when DJ was born, every single thing that David did was for the betterment of his son. David was so thrilled. It was actually said that when DJ was born, David really didn't even get that good of a look at his son. He just saw that it was a boy and ran out screaming like, I have a son, I have a boy. He was so, so thrilled. The thought of having that father-son relationship and bond was something that was really important to David, and he made sure that he sought that through and was there for DJ no matter what. And Samia and David, like I said, were on and off for a fairly long period of time, but it was really important for them after they decided to end their relationship to remain good co-parents for the sake of DJ, and they still had a lot of love for each other. And that whole father-son bond was not just important for David, it was incredibly important for DJ as well. He actually said that the bond and relationship he had with his dad was anything and everything that either of them could have ever asked for. They had an incredibly strong bond and they were best friends who did everything together. They bonded over their love of sports because they were both extremely athletic. David was six foot four. He was an athletic guy and that athleticism was passed down to DJ who at the time and still currently was playing football. David went to almost every single game of DJs. He wouldn't miss a game, and it was really a fun family event. Now, after his relationship with Samia ended, David definitely didn't have any problem finding a girlfriend or going on dates. He was a good-looking guy. He was funny. He was charming. He was determined, and something that most women 
look for. So this all brings us to 2018. And at this time, David, along with the rest of his family, were all living in Michigan. David had gone to a friend's birthday party. And at this birthday party is where he reconnected with an old friend of his from high school. And that would be a woman named Tamara Williams. Tamara, who also goes by Tammy, and that's what we'll be referring to her as, Tammy and David had gone to high school together and they were in the same grade, but they hadn't spoken in years. But all of that changed on this particular night. The two of them hit it off and started seeing each other more and more before ultimately they started dating. At the time, Tammy was working for the Detroit Medical Center and she was also a travel agent with two children. Now, from friends who knew Tammy in high school, they described her as being someone with a bubbly personality. She was very friendly, but she was also described as someone who constantly had a boyfriend. She was the type to jump from relationship to relationship. And David's relationship with Tammy was not something that anyone in his family saw coming. And at first, his family thought that this was just going to be some little fling, but over time, when they started seeing each other every day and started spending more and more time together, his family finally started to understand that this was a little bit more serious than they first anticipated. And when it came to David's relationship with Tammy, everyone in David's life, his family, his friends, everyone was happy to see David happy, but they weren't happy that he was with Tammy. Obviously, they supported David no matter what and always rooted for his happiness, but Tammy just screamed red flags from the beginning. And one really big thing that stood out to David's family from the beginning was the obsessiveness that Tammy seemed to have over David. It seemed that Tammy wanted to control him as much as possible. According to David's dad, he said that whenever there was a family gathering, whenever there was some sort of function where they would all get together, Tammy would just sit and watch David. If she wasn't speaking to David herself, she would just sit in the corner and just observe and watch every single person that David interacted with. And there was never really a time from the beginning where this relationship started, there was never a time where David really went without Tammy. Wherever he was, she was. And a perfect example of this controlling possessive behavior is just several weeks before David's death, he took his cousin out to go see a movie one night. And when he returned back home, he noticed his car tires were completely slashed, all four of them. And everyone in the family immediately knew that it had to have been Tammy who slashed the tires because she was jealous that David was spending time with someone else who wasn't her. So now we move on to September 28th of 2018, and this was a night of one of DJ's football games. Like I said, these football games were kind of like family functions for DJ's family. So of course his dad, David, was there. Tammy was also there. Tasia was there. Other family members were there. But what was noticeable about this game in particular was the fact that Tammy refused to sit near David or anyone in his family. David and his family were sitting more near the bottom of the bleachers, and when Tammy arrived, she just walked straight up to the very top. Now, according to the rest of the family, on this particular night, David seemed to be in really great spirits. He wasn't acting like anything was wrong, so everyone just assumed that maybe they got into a little bit of a fight or an argument on the way over here, and she was just cooling off, but she would be fine. Now, Samia actually remembers a moment in particular at that game where she turned around to look at Tammy, but to her surprise, when she went to look at Tammy, Tammy was already staring her down. She just looked straight at her. And Samia actually remembers and has said that this was a stare that she'll never forget. It was like she was being stared down almost. Now, little did David's family know when they were walking away from the football game that night that this would actually be the last time that they would see David. So this now all brings us to September 30th, 2018. 
Now on this day, DJ was actually scheduled to go over and spend the night at David's apartment since he split time between his mom's and his dad's. Now before that happened, DJ's mom, Samia, got a text from David saying that he was really sick, he didn't know what he came down with, but he feels awful and it would probably be best if DJ didn't come over that night. Now, when DJ heard about this, he started texting his dad, trying to see if he was okay, could he bring him anything, just trying to gauge what was really going on. And he also tried calling him, but David said that he couldn't talk over the phone right now because he really wasn't feeling well. Now, at that moment, DJ decided that regardless of what his dad was saying, he was going to go over to David's apartment anyways because he had left a couple items at the apartment. So he went over there to pick up some things. And when he drove over to the apartment complex and got out of his car, he noticed that Tammy was walking out of the apartment, carrying a trash bag through the parking lot to put into the dumpster. So how this looked is DJ and Tammy initially crossed paths. So Tammy was walking towards the dumpster. DJ was walking towards the apartment. Now, shortly after that, in kind of a split second, DJ remembers Tammy dropped whatever trash she was carrying into this dumpster, turned around and started running towards the apartment, almost as if she was trying to beat DJ to the apartment. She wanted to get there first. And of course, while DJ thought that her sprinting into the apartment was odd and strange. It really, nothing, it just doesn't register. It didn't really register at the moment of why is she trying to do that? Now, when DJ got to the apartment, he noticed that the door was locked, which was also very bizarre because Tammy had just seen him. She knew that he was coming to the apartment, but she decided to lock the door anyways. Now, luckily DJ had a key. So he opened the door with his key and walked in and that's where Tammy met him at the entrance way of the apartment. And she asked DJ what he was doing there to which DJ replied that he was there to get a phone charger of his. And had she seen his phone charger. Tammy quickly told DJ that she hadn't seen the phone charger, didn't know where it was. But through this conversation, something that DJ noticed automatically was the fact that his dad's bedroom door was shut, which was rare for him. It was typically always open. And along with that, the bathroom door was also shut. And once DJ noticed these things, he told Tammy that he was going to go into his dad's room and just see how he was and make sure he was okay. But that's when Tammy told DJ that David actually wasn't home. She said that he had gone out for a walk to get some fresh air, which to really anybody when hearing that wouldn't make a lot of sense because if David was as sick as everyone was making him out to be, there really would be no reason that he would just be casually going for a stroll around the neighborhood. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Along with that, it's cold outside. You know, for someone who's sick, you're not going to want to subject yourself to cold weather and just go for a random walk. And that also wasn't something that David did normally. So DJ didn't really understand what was going on and why his dad was going for a walk, why are the doors shut, Tammy's acting weird, everything is off. But again, that's just not where your mind goes at that time. And DJ actually had to be at his grandma's house shortly after this, so he couldn't stay for very long. So regardless of how weird he felt in that moment, he thought that maybe he was just being paranoid. So he ended up leaving David's apartment and driving away. Now this same day, September 30th was a Sunday and David was scheduled to go to work that day at about 5 a.m. However, he never showed up and his coworkers knew that this was really out of character for David. He never would miss a shift. And it wasn't until two or three more shifts went by over the next couple days that David missed where one of his coworkers called Tasia to let him know David hadn't been showing up for work. Now, when Tasia heard this, she obviously was worried and knew that something was wrong. She ended up calling David's phone and it was going straight to voicemail. She then decided to call Tammy, who did answer the phone, but told her that she hadn't seen David since Sunday. And remember at this point, it's now that following Tuesday. 
But regardless of that, Tasia and her husband Derek decided that they were going to go to David's apartment themselves just to check on him. And once they pulled up, one of the first things they noticed was that David's car was in the driveway. When they got to David's apartment door, they knocked several times before realizing that the door was already unlocked. Now, once they got to the apartment, they called Elliot, who was Tasia and David's father, and he decided to also go over and check on the apartment with them as well, and Samia joined them. Everyone immediately noticed that the state of David's apartment was not something he would have ever ever been okay with. David was what they called a neat freak. He was incredibly organized. He was always making sure that everything was in its place. Everything had a place. But when his family got to the apartment, they noticed that everything was a complete mess. The bed wasn't made. There were things thrown on the floor. There were dishes in the kitchen. There were sheets in the closet just thrown in there. And it was just not David. Now, when they got to David's bedroom, Tasia ended up looking under David's bed, and that is where she found a large red, what appeared to be blood stain on the carpet. There were also indentations in the carpet showing where the bed used to be, so it seemed like someone had recently moved the bed to cover the stain. Now, the comforter of the bed also had a big red stain on it, and there was a hole in the mattress that looked like it could have been a bullet hole. Along with that, there also was a small hole in the closet door. And once the family saw the state of David's apartment, they decided the best thing to do would be to leave the apartment because it was clear this apartment was a crime scene. And they decided to leave the apartment and go to the Melvindale Police Department on October 2nd and file a missing persons report for David Carter. Now, after filing the missing persons report, Tasia also called Tammy. She called Tammy asking if she had any information on David's whereabouts. Has she spoken to him? What's what's the deal? Because it seemed almost like she couldn't care less about what was happening, but she stuck to her story. She said she still hadn't heard from him. She didn't know anything. She hadn't seen him since Sunday. But Tasia could tell that something was not right. Tammy had been dating David for over six months at this point, and she did not seem to care that David was missing. And Tammy wasn't the type of person that didn't seem to care whether or not her boyfriend would be missing. This is the same person that slashed David's car tires, slashed all four of them for going to the movies with his cousin. This is not the type of person that just is nonchalant and just doesn't care. So now we move on to October 3rd. Now on October 3rd, which was one day after the missing persons report was filed, the chief of police called David's father, Elton, and asked if he could come down to the police station and answer some follow-up questions about David. Now Elton went down there and he sat down with the chief of police. And one of the first questions that this officer asked Elton was whether or not David had any tattoos. And David did have a a couple tattoos, one of which was a pit bull with red eyes on his leg. And when Elton told the police this, that is when he learned that two days prior on October 1st, so one day before the missing persons report was filed, there had been a discovery of human remains and the leg on the remains had the same tattoo as the one that David had. And through that and through other confirmation, they were able to determine that the remains that were found did in fact belong to David Carter. Now, how David's remains were recovered will probably shock you. David's body was found in a sleeping bag off of the I-75 freeway in Eagle Township, Ohio. He was discovered by an Ohio Department of Transportation worker who was on the side of the highway mowing the grass when he discovered the sleeping bag. The sleeping bag was then collected and sent off to the medical examiner, and she was absolutely shocked when she unzipped this sleeping bag and discovered that David's body had been completely dismembered and that the only remains that were in the sleeping bag were his lower torso and his legs, so the rest of his body was still missing. 
So not only does David's family have to get the news and process that David has passed away and was murdered, but now they also have to process the brutal way in which David's life was taken. So now we move on to October 5th. 2018. And this night, DJ actually had a football game and he decided that he was going to play. He was going to play for his dad. He dedicated the game to his dad. DJ said that his dad taught him the quote that no matter what happens in life, you just always have to keep going. And he applied that quote to that night. And it was one of DJ's best games at that point if not his best game period. He said that he felt like it wasn't just him playing that night. He felt like his dad was really there with him. They played so well that DJ's team actually ended up winning 64 to zero. And DJ said that seeing his family in the stands supporting him, seeing everyone in the stands supporting him that night was something that words can't explain. But at that football game on October 5th, Tasia actually got a call from her father who told her that police had made an arrest in David's case and that they had arrested Tammy. If you've ever had unprotected sex, forgot your birth control, had a condom broke, or you're just not sure, I'm excited to talk about a new company that is giving emergency contraception a much needed rebrand. Julie is an FDA approved morning after pill that helps stop pregnancy before it starts. Julie is aiming to be the next emergency contraception company for the next generation, one of learning and acceptance, not of stigma and shame. How it works is Julie stops your body from releasing an egg using the same active ingredients as plan B. So essentially, Julie works by preventing or delaying your ovulation. So with no egg, there's no fertilization and therefore no pregnancy. And you don't have to stress because there is no risk for future fertility. It works best when taken right away or within 72 hours of unprotected sex. It's legal in all 50 states. You do not need an ID prescription or credit card to get your hands on it. You can go to juliecare.co to learn more or find Julie at your nearest Walmart today. That's juliecare.co to learn more. On a winter night in a small community near Denver, Colorado, Jim Matthews arrived home late. He expected to find his 12-year-old daughter who'd been dropped off after a Christmas concert. But when he called out, hi Janelle, the house was eerily quiet. His daughter's shoes were on the floor, but she was gone and it would be 35 years before she would be found dead. After the discovery of Janelle Matthews' body in 2019, the police turned their attention to a man who had told law enforcement years ago that he knew something, but they dismissed him. The man did seem obsessed with the case, but is that all it was? A true crime fanatic or a killer? Now, a jury will decide if Janelle's murderer was hiding in plain sight the entire time. Wondery and Campsides Media podcast Suspect is back for a second season with a story that attempts to separate one man's true crime obsession from a motive for murder. Hey, Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast Suspect, Vanished in the Snow, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. So police had arrested Tammy on October 5th and they brought her in for questioning. And according to police, they conducted multiple interviews with Tammy, trying to collect as much information as they could. But she stood by her story that she hadn't seen David since Sunday. So unfortunately, because police didn't have the rest of David's remains, they couldn't identify a cause of death at that point. And so after that, they ended up having to release her, which is what they did. And you got to imagine how much of a gut punch that is thinking, okay, we're finally getting somewhere. We're finally going to, you know, get justice for our loved one, for David. And it ends up just being ripped away from you. You get the rug pulled out from underneath from you again and police just let her go. And again, like I said, a big part of that was because they didn't have the cause of death because they didn't have the rest of the remains. However, five days later on October 10th, that would all change. On October 10th, more remains were recovered on the same I-75 interstate. Now these remains were sent off to the medical examiner. And when she opened the true religion duffel bag, which contained the remains, she discovered David's head inside of it. So now they had the lower part of his body as well as his head. 
Then, a couple days later, on October 16th, the remainder of David's remains were found. These remains were found north of Finley, Ohio, in a suitcase. The suitcase itself almost looked like it belonged to a child. It was yellow and had flowers drawn all over it. And inside of the suitcase was a comforter. And inside of the comforter were the third and final set of David's remains. So now that all of the remains were recovered, the medical examiner was able to determine a cause of death, and she concluded that David Carter died from a gunshot wound to the head. The gunshot was on the right side of his head behind his ear, almost in the back of his neck. The exit wound was then on the top of David's head on the other side, so the bullet pretty much went straight through. The medical examiner was able to conclude that the shot was made from very close range, almost as if it were right up to David's head at the time. The medical examiner also found that there were no other defense wounds on David at the time and no other injury anywhere. However, something that she did discover was the fact that David had an antihistamine found in his bloodstream, which is basically a common cold or allergy medication that can cause you to be tired. That's one of the main symptoms as it causes you to be drowsy. Now, as far as the cuts that were made to dismember David's body, the medical examiner concluded that more than likely they were made with nothing more than just a kitchen knife. And because of that, the dismemberment process would have taken a very long period of time. So because the police now had the cause of death and all of the remains, David's family was really just waiting for police to arrest Tammy. You would think that would be the next step. You have the cause of death, which they were waiting for. You have the remains, which you were waiting for. So now it's time to make an arrest. But weirdly enough, October came and went, then November came and went, same thing with December, and the family never really got any real update as to what was going on or what was taking so long. Then on December 20th of 2018, police issued an arrest warrant for Tammy for first degree homicide. However, it wasn't until January of 2019 where David's family would learn that Tammy actually wasn't even in Michigan anymore. Police informed David's family that Tammy was now on the run. Police had no idea where she was, and to this day, she is still on the run and wanted for the murder of David Carter. Now again, this is just another devastating blow to this family because can you imagine, not only are you grieving and processing in the best way that you can this unimaginable loss, but then police arrest the person that is believed to be responsible for this, but then they let her go because they don't have the two things that they said that they needed, which were the cause of death and the remainder of the remains. They get those two things, but still no progress is made. And two months go by and nothing is really said of it. Nothing is done. And then an arrest warrant is put out. And it's not until weeks later where you learn that the person that is responsible for this, the person who was the prime suspect in this, no one knows where they are. They can't find them. They're just missing. Because how do you lose a prime suspect? in a case like this. And it's been really frustrating for David's family. And there have been a lot of frustration towards the police for not having enough urgency in this case from the beginning. Now, since Tammy has been on the run, police have brought in the US Marshals for assistance in locating her. However, to this day, no one knows where she is. Well, actually there are people who probably more than likely know where she is. It's just a matter of revealing that information. So we don't know where Tammy is, but what we do know is that police believe that the weapon that was used to kill David, because it has never been found to this day, it is believed that Tammy has at least that weapon on her. So she is considered to be armed and dangerous. So let's talk about the last known whereabouts of Tammy. So on October 16th, 2018, which was the day that the final set of remains were recovered, Tammy had made several ATM withdrawals in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Police then have surveillance footage of her eating dinner by herself at a restaurant. And after she ate, she then took one of those carriage rides that you see in cities where someone's biking and you sit in the back of the carriage. She took one of those, 
to her hotel. Now, the morning of the 17th of October, she then took an Amtrak train from Ann Arbor, Michigan to Chicago. She then got on another train when she got to Chicago and took that to Penn Station in New York. So if you look at it on a map, she goes from Michigan to Chicago and then from Chicago all the way back to New York. So she's really backtracking. When she got to New York, she stayed at the Neptune Hotel, which is located in Brooklyn. And remember at this point, no one knew to look for Tammy because no one knew that she was on the run. So when she checked into the Neptune Hotel, she didn't check in under any alias. She checked in with her ID. And when she got up the next morning on October 18th, she was seen on surveillance footage leaving the hotel, and that was the last time that Tammy was ever seen. Now, when it comes to the family's theory as to what happened, they believe that David had been trying to break it off with Tammy for some time and was working on a way of how to do that considering her controlling and possessive behavior. They believe that the reason she sat so far away from the rest of the family at DJ's football game was because they got into a fight and David alluded to the fact that he wanted to end their relationship. They then believe that sometime later that night, whether the two of them went their separate ways or went back to David's apartment together, David went to sleep in his bed and Tammy ended up shooting him in the head with the gun that it is believed to still be with her. And again, this is all alleged and it is a theory, but this is what the police and the family now believe. So as of now, Tammy is currently still a wanted fugitive and she's still on the run. The last time Tasia spoke to Tammy was on October 2nd, asking about David's whereabouts, but no one has been able to get a hold of her after that. Tammy stands at five foot five and was 190 pounds when she went on the run. She has brown hair and brown eyes and a large tattoo of a rose on her arm that starts from her shoulder and goes down to her elbow. Now, before all of this, Tammy was someone who liked dressing up. She liked wigs and makeup and all of it. So people believe it's very possible that she could be altering her appearance to try and throw people off and to just disguise herself. Now, Tammy's family has all insisted that none of them have heard from her and that no one has spoken to her. However, even the police and pretty much everyone believes that's a lot of BS, just to put it bluntly, on a multitude of different levels. She needs to be staying somewhere. She's living somewhere. She's being financed by someone, whether that's someone who's giving her money, whether that be a family member or a friend or whether that be an employer that she used an alias with. She's getting financed somewhere. Someone knows her. That's just the bottom line. Someone knows her. She's not, I don't believe that she's just in hiding for four years and hasn't seen a single person, hasn't talked to a single person. And I do believe that she is still alive. And because her friends had previously described her as someone who jumped from relationship to relationship, it's also possible that she's dating someone new, which is kind of crazy to think about, but it is very possible that she is currently dating someone who could be her way of being supported financially. Now, currently there is a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of Tammy. And I'm gonna put all the information and all the links in the description box below. If you have any information, I'm gonna put the phone numbers, all of it will be down there. Now, when it comes to David's family, they are doing everything in their power, everything they can to continue his legacy and get as much coverage on his case as possible to hopefully one day get justice for David. Nothing and no one will ever be able to fill the light that David was and the light that he brought to his family and the comfort that he brought to his family. So now the only thing that they can do is to get justice for what happened to him. And not only did David's family have to deal with the loss of David and process and grieve that loss, but six days prior to David's murder, David's mom, Marie, was actually diagnosed with cancer. And when she found out that David had been murdered, she refused to go to any of her cancer treatments. And ultimately, she ended up passing away shortly after as well due to the cancer because she was so heartbroken that she couldn't go to these cancer treatments because she was just 
grieving the loss of her son, which is something that no one should ever have to deal with. So now it's two major losses, two monumental losses that this family has to deal with. The loss of a brother, a father, a son, a friend, you know, and then the loss of a mother, a wife, and a grandmother. It's just unfathomable. So I really think that this case is so important. Why it's not gotten more coverage, I have no idea, but I want you guys to hear this case. I want you guys to talk about it. I want you guys to share it because I think it's so important that we get David and his family justice. But with that being said, you guys, that is going to be all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss another episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you're not gonna wanna miss it. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys and until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye.